Hello, and welcome. My name is Jennifer Peterson. I'm the director of the Emerging Leaders Program here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Thank you to everyone who is joining us via YouTube from wherever you are in the world. And a big thanks to those of you who are here in studio with us in Chicago, joining us for an on-the-record program of policy flash talks from members of the Emerging Leaders Class of 2022. For those of you at home, we will welcome you to submit questions for today's presenters by going to ccga.live. For those of you here in studio, you may ask your questions from the microphone in the center of the room once we transition to Q&A. As a reminder, the Council is a nonprofit, independent, and nonpartisan platform. The views expressed by individuals who we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. Additionally, tonight's speakers present these policy recommendations in their personal capacity and do not represent the positions of their employers. For 100 years, the Council has led the charge to bring conversations on major global issues to Chicago and its communities. Since 2008, the Emerging Leaders Program has worked to equip Chicago's globally conscious professionals to understand and address how what happens in the world impacts Chicago and how in turn what happens in Chicago affects the world. Program alumni contribute to this city and beyond by serving in a variety of roles, from leading essential Chicago nonprofits and businesses to serving in elected office. These leaders work to address the emergent challenges of an increasingly complex world and bring real change to their communities. The Emerging Leaders Class of 2022 has been together since July 2021, in fact, in this very room. They've been navigating the changing circumstances of the pandemic so that they could come together to contemplate how to address some of the most challenging issues facing our world. This hasn't always been easy, but they have enthusiastically shown up to consider what might come next and how change can be realized. I wanna offer my warm congratulations to all the members of the 2022 class. We're very proud to count you amongst the council's ranks. Now for this evening, take a moment. What's something in the world that really worries you? Maybe that keeps you up at night. It's not homework, but I do want you to take a moment to think about that. Now, how might you address that challenge? This has been the task that we've put to these emerging leaders with these policy flash talks. As you will see, it's easy to identify the challenges in the world. It's much harder to identify solutions. The emerging leaders that you will hear from this evening have developed these talks over the course of the program year. These talks focus on the need for policy innovations to help bolster America's place in the world. The talks have been developed by themselves independently but have received great feedback from council staff, as well as EL program special advisor, Cecile Shea. Now, let me introduce you to our evening speakers. First up, Hassan al Shawaf, U.S. Tax Council and Director of U.S. Tax Planning at BMO Financial Group. Dan Fenske is a partner at Mayor Brown. Milena Hessel serves as Associate Director of Policy at Elevate. Joyce Merkel is Vice President of Foreign Exchange Trading at U.S. Bank. Julien Rosanne is Trade Commissioner at the Consulate General of Canada here in Chicago. And lastly, Vidisha Suman serves as partner at Kearney. After their presentations this evening, we'll welcome your questions from both those of you here in the room as well as those of you online. Now, please join me in welcoming our first speaker this evening, Vidisha Suman. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you to the Council for this opportunity. My policy recommendation today is focused on establishing tech hubs across the U.S. I'm going to start the presentation today with a few statistics. One third of U.S. GDP or gross domestic product is generated by 10 large cities, which includes Silicon Valley, Austin, Seattle, New York, and Boston, often referred as tech hubs. The Silicon Valley by itself has 51% of US market cap and 47% of unicorns. 
Uh, a unicorn is a privately held startup company that is valued at over one billion. Now, research has shown there is a strong correlation between tech hubs and economic development. In fact, a recent World Economic Forum report suggests that two thirds of potential productivity growth in major economies over the next decade is projected to come from tech investments. Yet, it remains concentrated in 10 tech hubs today in the US. Now, here's the opportunity. In the US today, the tech sector supports 20% of the economy with job creation for 5.2 million workers. 33% of these tech-based employment is driven by tech startups. 50% of these tech startups, particularly those in the Silicon Valley, are headed by immigrants. And 75% of these immigrants started in the US as students. Now, what if we created a special visa category for immigrant students who are aspiring tech entrepreneurs to invest and settle in areas outside the well-established tech hubs. The proposed new visa category can boost economic development of these cities by expanding and creating a level playing field for technology innovations. The US immigration system today has investment startup visas as well as employee visas. However, there is the absence of a visa category for high potential recent graduates who intend to be tech entrepreneurs, but may not have the funding required. I am proposing we offer these students without funding a non-immigrant or a guest worker visa for a defined period that is automatically convertible to an immigrant visa or a green card if and when they have procured funding. If there is no funding and viability during the period, they return home. Now, the question is, is there any precedent for geography-based visas like this? The answer is yes. Back home in the US itself from the field of medicine. In the US, we provide immigration and naturalization incentives to foreign physicians who agree to practice in underserved communities for a minimum number of years. Now, how do we implement this new visa category? I am proposing five eligibility criteria that is both quantifiable as well as governable. The first is qualification. So qualifying students could be top quartile foreign students from top tech and engineering universities. The focus should be on merit and certainly not placing any caps based on nationality. The second is jurisdiction. The cities or metropolitan areas that are covered and we could start with cities with less than five tech unicorn companies in a year to allow for equitable growth. Third is the duration. How long do you have to stay in the covered cities or metropolitan areas? I'm proposing we start with at least five years post visa grant that gives you the opportunity to establish your technology idea and create jobs for, uh, for more people in this jurisdiction. Number four is the idea. So instead of promoting any tech entrepreneur idea, how about we promote specific startup ideas that are focused on sustainability or climate control? Things that the United States as well as the, United, uh, the overall world requires at this point. And the fifth piece is sponsorship. So in lieu of secured funding, it'll be great to have sponsorship from either a university or a venture capital sponsor. These requirements can be reviewed every year based on the impact from the program, which can be um, adjusted and it can be quantified based on job created in this defined period from the tech entrepreneurship program. Now, the question may arise, are we favoring immigrants over US citizens? I acknowledge that many people would argue that we should instead improve education opportunities for our citizens, especially because importing skilled labor and skilled talent can take the onus of local governments to fund and for local businesses to demand a full, rigorous, well-rounded education for our children as well as young adults. Increasing the number of immigrant tech entrepreneurs is in no way intended to negate the need to strengthen American education. We need to do both if we are going to compete in the global marketplace and not to mention creating a healthy society and democracy. 
I am also proposing Congress to establish a commission to review and suggest revisions to this program staffed with economic, labor force, and other experts. The proposed commission will also have the mandate to assess any negative impact of this visa category on education system or even the labor market at large for US born persons. Now, having been a consultant for a while and working with a lot of tech companies, I can tell you there is a need to act on this right now. The intangible asset of innovation is becoming an increasingly important driver of economic success. U.S. policymakers can support equitable economic development across U.S. cities by enhancing the immigration policy to support economic growth across all locations. Thank you so much. Good evening and, and thank you for being here tonight. Uh, my talk is on how to strengthen our economy and national security by helping smaller businesses mitigate global supply chain risks. Republicans and Democrats may not agree on much, but they agree that global supply chain risks are real and they've proposed a number of solutions to the problem, like bringing home the development of goods critical to the national economy. But global supply chain risks are too complicated to be solved through government dictated policy solutions alone. Individual companies need to take proactive steps as well. The biggest US companies don't need government assistance to understand these issues. They have the means to do it themselves. But many small and medium sized businesses, often called SMEs, do not. So Congress should fund a program through which SMEs could seek expert assistance to understand and mitigate their unique supply chain risks. From beginning to end, companies of all sizes throughout the United States depend on products from foreign countries, many with interests that do not align with ours. For example, the pandemic has shown the United States vulnerability to Chinese made PPE. Narrow supply chains also leave us exposed to non-political risks like natural disasters. In 2011, for example, earthquakes in Japan disrupted global supply chains for automotive parts, tablet screens, and other products. And while the news focuses on high profile items like iPhones and semiconductors, many overlook the impact on small businesses. That's unfortunate. Small businesses account for 44% of US GDP. And these businesses face substantial international supply chain risks. The Census Bureau recently reported that 7% of small businesses report needing to find an alternative foreign supplier, a 50% increase from a similar survey only a few months prior. In a country with, depending on how you count it, up to 30 million SMEs, that equates to over 2 million companies with an acknowledged need to find alternative foreign suppliers. And almost half of small business manufacturers have said that they need to identify new supply chain options more generally within the next six months. Those numbers are just the tip of the iceberg because the biggest risk to a company could be a downstream foreign supplier the company never deals with directly. If you own a small business selling educational toys, for example, made overseas, you may know who your supplier is. And perhaps you had the foresight to buy from a supplier, for example, who, who does not manufacture in China so that your products could not be held hostage during a trade dispute with China. But do you know who makes the plastic used in the toys? The electronics, are those components made in China? How likely is it that your component parts could be caught up in an international dispute with China? If that happens, how will that impact the manufacturing of the toys that you sell? If you can't get your hands on those toys, what alternatives exist? What risks do those alternatives have? As this example shows, knowing risks at the first step of a supply chain just isn't good enough. Companies need to understand their risks all the way down to the mine supplying the raw materials used to create the products they buy and sell. And these are not just economic risks, they are national security ones too. Supply chains that end in or cross through a country with interests hostile to the United States 
give those countries leverage over U.S. foreign policy. So it is in the United States economic and national security interests to help smaller businesses understand their global supply chain risks. A publicly funded program can help do this. Under this program, small businesses, either individually or through trade associations or the like, could hire global supply chain experts to help them assess their supply chain risks. The program would be structured to incentivize SMEs to use it through modest fees and a corresponding public subsidy of the costs of the program. This program would empower SMEs to understand from where their critical components are sourced, which components involve substantial geopolitical or other risks, and what steps the companies can take to diversify their supply chains and minimize those risks. It would give the government greater insight into supply chain problems in particular industries by giving government personnel access to detailed information about different small businesses and sectors of the economy. So why should the government be involved in this? Why don't SMEs have the ability and incentive to address this issue on their own? The answer is that SMEs are not the only ones impacted by their supply chain risks. Their customers and suppliers, in other words, all of us, bear those risks as well. So in wonkish terms, there's a negative externality problem here that warrants some kind of government intervention. And the intervention I am advocating for is of the mildest kind. No government mandates as to who can buy what from where, just a government funded program to give SMEs the information they need to make their own decisions, but to make those decisions in ways that will likely benefit us all as helping smaller businesses understand their unique supply chain risks is in everyone's interests. Thank you very much. Solar panel prices have plummeted in recent years. So how many of you have taken advantage of that to put solar on your roofs? One person for folks online. That's about what I expected. Solar is cheap and clean, but more than 80% of American households cannot access the benefits of rooftop solar. Their houses are shaded, their roofs are shaded, or otherwise unsuitable, or they rent or live in a condo building where they just can't put solar on their roofs. Furthermore, low-income communities and communities of color are more likely to have unsuitable roofs and have higher portions of renter households, exacerbating disparities in solar access that already exist due to issues like high upfront cost and barriers to financing. Luckily, there's a simple solution that a number of states have already taken to ensure that all their citizens have access to cheap, clean solar electricity. That solution is called community solar. Community solar uses shared off-site solar projects to transform solar from something that only a handful of households can use to a widely accessible tool for entire communities to save money and combat climate change. Community solar is a little like a community garden. Folks who can't have a garden in their own backyard share the fruits and vegetables that a community garden produces. Likewise, folks who can't put solar on their roofs subscribe to a share in an off-site shared solar project and get credit for the electricity their subscription pushes back out onto the grid on their electric bills. The thing is, for this to work, there has to be a way for that community solar customer to get credit for that electricity on their bills. This is where state policy comes in. Most states already have policies in place to compensate rooftop solar customers for the electricity their systems push back out onto the grid. It works like this. When the sun's shining and your solar panels are producing and you're at home using electricity, that's great. Your house is using that electricity. But when you're not there, that electricity generated by the solar goes back out onto the grid for your neighbors to use, and you get credit on your bill for that electricity. To enable community solar, states need to expand this mechanism, or one like it, to include shared off-site solar projects to make it possible for community solar customers to get credit on their electric bills 
for that energy their solar subscription produces. With fair crediting in place, community solar companies can generally price their subscriptions below the community solar credit that the customer will see on their bill. This means that the company can make money even while the customer saves. So for example, let's say you are a community solar customer. In this model, you wouldn't pay anything up front. Instead, you'd pay a monthly charge to your community solar company. In the example on the slides, $40. But you'd also get a credit on your bill that would more than offset that charge allowing you to actually save money on a month-to-month -month basis. Furthermore, the community solar charge that you and other subscribers like you are paying to the company helps creates a long-term cash flow that helps the company attract investors willing to front the cost of building those projects in the first place. But this whole model, it only works with fair crediting in place. Expanding existing solar bill crediting policies to include shared off-site solar projects is a simple way to truly make solar energy available to all. Low-income communities and renters deserve to access the benefits of solar just as much as their upper-income homeowning neighbors. And with community solar, they can. Community solar flips upside down many of the barriers that make solar, rooftop solar difficult to access for some folks. Its larger project size allows it to take advantage of economies of scale, driving down costs. Projects are already remote, so you can take your subscription with you when you move across town. And financing occurs at the project level, making the question not whether a family can afford an entire system, but whether they can pay their electricity bill next month. Furthermore, community solar stands to benefit more than just households. There are plenty of businesses, nonprofits, and government buildings that can't put solar on their roofs and would love to share, to subscribe to a share in a community solar project. And in addition to the environmental benefits, community solar brings local economic development through construction jobs and property tax revenue. Some of you may already live in states that have established community solar programs. Here in Illinois, we're lucky that we have one, but many states have not. With solar expanding more rapidly than ever, now is the time to enable community solar in every state in the country. This will allow citizens and businesses across the country to save money while going solar. And that will accelerate our transition to clean, renewable energy. Thank you. Good afternoon. Imagine that you own a small or medium-sized business in Chicagoland. Like most exporters in the region, you already trade goods or services for neighbors in Canada. But you don't have the resources nor the expertise to venture to Africa, to set up an office in Europe, or hire consultants in Asia. If you're in France, you could utilize the Volontariat International en Entreprise, BIE. This program from the French government sends international business interns abroad to work for French companies, mostly in Europe, North America, and Asia, which are the main trading partners of France. I interviewed a French company uh, that used this program uh, here in Chicago while being incubated at HemHub. And this is what they have to say. According to the CEO, the VA formula is an easy way to recruit and send talent abroad in a cost-effective and timely manner. And as far as the intern, she got hired as a manager and doubled their revenue in the US market before going back to France. So we should create our own program right here in Chicago. This is what I propose. The state of Illinois should launch a trade core, a program that will send young Americans overseas to pursue commercial objectives on behalf of our local companies. This program will be run by the Illinois Department of Commerce, and we will make sure that we target key industry sectors of our economy, advanced manufacturing, 
cleantech, life science, agri-food, logistics, and professional services. Companies in those sectors will be matched the best talent in town, in business, engineering, science, technology, and innovation. So how does it work? Well, a company will contact its uh, local small business development center, request some information, submit a proposal, and then they will publish their offer on a job matching platform. Those will be one year long paid position abroad. Companies will interview applicants and to make sure that we include a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens, companies that select underserved candidates should qualify for employment tax-based incentives from the state of Illinois. Then the selected intern will be sent abroad. But well, abroad where? Well, the Illinois Office of Trade and Investment already has existing foreign representation in six countries, Canada, Mexico, Belgium, Israel, China, and Japan. So we could start there and make sure that we leverage this network within diplomatic missions overseas to provide all the support for both our companies and interns. Because we're not just going to send those young people into the wild, right? <laughs> they will need the proper training, preparation, uh, as far as culture, um, security briefings, depending on the uh, country. Uh, we want them to have all the uh, support in terms of and services for their visas, uh, healthcare, housing, to make sure that they are ready uh, before going abroad. So obviously, the state of Illinois will need to hire more staff, probably 20 to 30 employees, both at home and overseas, which will come to a cost. But we should not forget that Illinois export activities represent 800,000 more than 800,000 local jobs. So not only will the trade core minimize cost and risk for companies to venture overseas, it will bolster Illinois export. And it will communicate to Illinois taxpayers that the state is committed to the local economy, local employment, while building a new generation of business leaders with international expertise. So this is a younger version of me. This is a, a lived experience as I was myself part of the uh, French International Internship Program. And what I want to leave you with is this. I am convinced that a successful trade core program in Illinois will inspire other states and pave the way to a federal program that will promote free trade and ultimately promote peace. Thank you. It is irrefutable that the US dollar is currently the global funding currency, providing the United States increased authority over global financial systems and increased leverage in global trade and sanctions. Therefore, the status of the dollar is deeply entwined with US national security. However, that status is at risk. In 1991, the dollar accounted for over 71% of global foreign exchange reserves. But that number has declined to just under 60% as of 2021, according to the IMF. The cause is mostly diversification. Take, for instance, crypto coins, which are unsecured digital alternatives to money issued by governments. Their value can be highly volatile, acting more like an asset driven by market forces and susceptible to crashes. Nonetheless, crypto's market share grew by a staggering 187% in 2021 alone. The growth and popularity of e-currencies has prompted some central banks to develop their own digital coins. With a government-backed value that is reliably more stable than crypto coins, but offering similar digital benefits. The most concerning of these is China, who is currently furthest along in maximizing widespread use of their e-currency technology, the EU1. Consequently, this provides China the opportunity to shape the future of global digital currency structures. However, China's authoritarian political culture does not contain the rule of law as we do in the United States, and this poses a threat to international free markets. 
in order to secure the dollar status as the global funding currency the, and check China's unrivaled advancement into digital money markets, the United States Federal Reserve should issue a digital dollar that is globally available, privacy protected, and guaranteed. In practice, the digital dollar would have the same spending power as physical cash. That is one dollar bill equals one digital dollar. It would either be account-based or token-based. Account-based coins allow traditional banks to remain as intermediaries, handling regulatory information and issuing coins directly. This model would be most appropriate for US citizens. In contrast, token-based digital dollars are developed to allow limited amounts of the coin to work offline, transferred via NFP or Bluetooth technology that already exists on cell phones today. This allows consumers and businesses to transact without internet access as is needed for credit cards and debit cards, or even using ATMs to withdraw cash. The latter is essential for international use and the global unbanked, creating a boon for less developed areas concerned about counterfeit cash or who simply do not have consistent access to banking infrastructure. Digital dollars would be more secure and faster, settling in seconds rather than days, and cheaper than the fees levied by wires and credit cards. Project Hamilton, a co-venture between the Federal Reserve of Boston and MIT, suggests the final version of digital dollars may be a hybrid of both. Policy changes are also needed to secure privacy. Congress could extend the protections guaranteed by the Right to Financial Privacy Act, limiting access to non-public financial records to the US digital coin once built, and providing for a more safeguarded version of digital currency than China's political culture would design. Providing this coin to the global citizens preserves the dollar status as the most globally used currency and prevents less trustworthy actors like China from dictating how e-currency channels are built. Fed Governor Waller argues that improving private digital offerings like PayPal would sufficiently address issues in existing payment systems. While this may be generally true, especially in developed countries, there are several other benefits digital dollars provide. For example, improving efficiency in how social security or stimulus money can be distributed directly into digital wallets rather than with checks would also aid unbanked individuals. Also, the cost to maintain physical infra banking infrastructure used to accept cash deposits could be scaled back, which the Harvard Business Review currently estimates at about $600 billion a year to run. And most importantly, keeping the US dollar as a global reserve currency helps enforce financial sanctions that would be less effective if other e-currencies become more dominant. Digital transitions are not immediately tangible making it easy to think there is time to continue investigating the case for United States-backed e-currencies. This is a mistake. Effectively responding to digital currencies requires coordination and cooperation between private and public stakeholders. As a national security imperative, the US cannot wait for other less trustworthy agencies to drive the direction of stablecoin technology, but rather should assume its long established place as a leader of global finance by investing in U.S. digital dollar today. Thank you. Hello, everyone. To begin, I want you to imagine that you are the CEO of a fast-growing Chicago company. Perhaps you have just received a capital contribution and are finally ready to expand internationally. Your business development team has narrowed down the options to two. Toronto, Canada, and London, England. There's no language barrier in either. Both have skilled workforces, and their corporate income tax rates are similar. While the UK market may be larger, Canada is geographically closer. Which country do you pick for your investment? Now imagine your tax advisor comes to you with a last bit of information. If you repatriate or bring back profits from Canada, there's a 5% withholding tax on dividends while there's no similar tax in the UK. Does this make your decision to invest in the UK easier? What are some of the larger economic implications of this tax difference? And while I have no qualms with our friends in the UK, I contend that if the United States and Canada work together to reduce this withholding tax rate to 0%, 
it would increase cross-border investment and economic growth. And as an American working for a Canadian bank, I have an interest in seeing one of the most important trading relationships in the world be as strong, seamless, and unified as possible. The method in which countries negotiate lower withholding tax rates is generally a bilateral tax treaty. Bilateral tax treaties have multiple purposes, but here let's focus on a primary purpose. To reduce double taxation of income as two countries can claim taxing rights on income originating in one country, which we call the source country, and paid to a resident of another country, which we call the resident country. In our example of a Chicago company investing in a Toronto subsidiary, Canada would be the source of the dividend, where the United States would be the resident country of the recipient. To the extent a treaty allows a source country to tax income, it generally requires the resident country to provide a credit against or exemption from its own taxes. In the context of the U.S.-Canada relationship, the relevant tax treaty reduces the dividend withholding tax rate to 5% in the case of a subsidiary paying a dividend to its parent. While the treaty provides for a credit, the statutory schemes of both countries effectively deny the credit, but generally exempt the credit from an additional layer of corporate income tax. This typically results in three layers of tax. Let's return to our example. Canada would tax the Toronto subsidiary on its profits. It would then levy a 5% withholding tax on any dividends paid to the Chicago parent. While the United States wouldn't tax the Chicago parent on those dividends received, it would tax the shareholders of the Chicago parent when they receive a dividend. This can potentially result in a total tax burden in excess of 50%. The United States has negotiated a 0% withholding tax rate for this fact pattern with most of its major allies. Canada thus far has not negotiated a 0% rate with any country in part because, in my view, it negotiates based upon an increasingly outdated treaty model that provides for such withholding. A withholding tax rate in excess of 0% allows double taxation to persist at the corporate level, and finally for a third time at the shareholder level. Economic evidence suggests that this additional layer of tax deters cross-border investment. That is, the tax to repatriate or bring money and capital back functions to prevent money and capital from flowing in. And when we prevent money and capital from flowing in, we ultimately hamper economic growth, which reduces tax revenue and the prospect for our workers. I, in fact, owe my job to US-Canada cross-border investment. The withholding tax also harms shareholders, many of which are foundations, pension funds, and retirement accounts, because shareholders ultimately bear the burden of this withholding tax, even if it is more opaque and hidden. If Canada and the United States, via treaty, work together to reduce the withholding tax on dividends to 0%, it would increase cross-border investment and economic growth. And if we return to our example of a Chicago CEO, they just might decide to invest in Canada over another country, and one of their counterparts in the North might just decide to invest here in Chicago rather than elsewhere. In doing so, we will be creating opportunities for our workers and our companies on both sides of the border. Thank you. Okay, so as I noted earlier, this is the time for questions. If you'd like to ask a question and you are online, please visit ccga.live. You can also do that if you're feeling a little shy here in the room. If you're feeling less shy in the room, feel free to step up to the center mic. We are happy to uh, entertain questions from you all here. Let me get started with the first question. Dan, we've got a question here online for you. Isn't this something the government should be doing already? Wasn't the burgeoning global cooking oil shortage, which I'm sure you know well, or the risk to the baby formula supply totally predictable? Uh, I, I think I agree with the premise of the question, which is something that the government definitely should be doing. Um, I think the, the, the reason behind my policy idea and how it complements what the government's sort of already doing, right, is there are, the Biden administration has an ongoing set of supply chain um, 
supply chain issues or policies that are designed to get at sort of the things that the government sees as being particularly important, you know, semiconductors, lithium ion batteries, et cetera, are sort of the, the, the key ones. But the premise of my idea is that as we learned in the PPE example uh, during the pandemic, and as your question uh, uh, also brings up, the government's never going to have full insight into what all the supply chain risks are, but the small companies who face this every day will. And this will be a way not only of solving those problems, but also of giving government the information it needs to then also act uh, and enact different policies that might be a little bit more government-centered. Great. Thank you, Dan. We have a question live here in the room. Hello. Um, sorry, I, your name just blanked on me, but the person who talked about visas. Um, Vidisha. Vidisha, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is the biggest obstacle to making that happen? Uh, just one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the biggest obstacle is... Um, I would say the mindset. Um, I had mentioned in the program in my policy as well that there are challenges. And I was speaking about, um, I spoke to my colleagues and as well as some folks in the in the council. The question that was raised is why should we just focus on immigrants? And it it is always a question that's being raised. I am an immigrant myself. I came to America with my big American dream, and I can tell you one thing: there are statistics that's proving that there is a lot of benefit that we can get from immigrant population uh, that's not effectively um, used and utilized today in the United States. So for me, the biggest obstacle would be just going outside of that mindset that we need to just focus on uh, US citizens and looking at the American dream as a place where um, America is fulfilled and developed as a land of immigrants and the land of opportunities for everybody who can come and survive and sustain and create an opportunity for themselves. Great. Joyce, we have a question here for you online. One of the rationales for Chinese central bank to explore digital currency is said to be a greater level of control over and insight into individual spending. How does a digital dollar avoid these privacy concerns? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think the way that it avoids it is specifically by making policy that protects um, these very important um, privacy issues. Um, the Rights of Financial Privacy Act is something that we currently use today to protect um, all of our accounts, um, our banking accounts, and ensure that the government cannot uh, look at our information without um, a warrant or without a good reason. These kinds of protections are already trusted and in society today and can be extended to a digital coin to um, not only protect U.S. citizens, but also international citizens. And for that reason, it would be um, a better option than what China can uh, offer to the national market and the international market. Great. Hassan, next question is for you. Sure. All right, the question is, won't your proposal cost the U.S. Treasury money? Is this the time to be cutting corporate taxes? So it's a great question. Um, so I, I think there are um, there are a couple things uh, to consider. Um, you know, al although you reduce the withholding tax revenue, um, you are creating more tax revenue from from more economic growth. Um, the United States has kind of made that calculus that it's beneficial with. A number of other treaty partners. Um, so, uh, you know, in the end, um, I I don't think that it, it, as much revenue is lost as as people would think. I, I think that um, a zero percent withholding rate. I think it has um, benefits beyond just uh, the simple economics too. I didn't I didn't mention that in in my um, in my in my talk, but I think it can bring uh, countries closer together, kind of economically tie them together closely. So there are also benefits beyond um, uh, the ones related to economics. So I think if there's any tax revenue lost, it's more than offset by, by other benefits. Okay, great. Julianne, what kind of support will overseas Illinois trade offices supply to these interns? You touched on this a little bit, but I think the question asker would like to hear a bit more. And then the follow-up question is, aren't those services available from the private sector? Uh, so in terms of services, as I mentioned, um, before the interns are sent abroad, they will need uh, cultural preparation, depending on which country they are they're going, maybe language preparation as well. 
Um, they will need uh, security briefings depending on the risk on, on, of the country where they're going. Uh, but also they will need support to get housing, to get um, their visas, to um, uh, healthcare would be also important for them. Um, so this is something that uh, I think only the, 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 the state should, uh, should provide, or I mean the government should provide. I think that you know, letting a, a private uh, company or someone from the private sector to um, deliver those services might be uh, a security risk. Um, so I think that obviously the state of Illinois might not be able to do that on their own. And this is why they will uh, need the support from the federal government, uh, especially uh, foreign officers uh, within dip diplomatic missions uh, abroad uh, or partners such as the U.S. Commercial Service that will, you know, already provide this kind of services and will be able to uh, uh, support uh, the interns. Great. Thank you. Elena, no surprise that this question is for you, I suppose. Is there a downside to your proposal? Why have some states not already adopted it? You noted on your map that several have adopted similar, but why, why haven't we seen this adopted more broadly? Sure. Um, so the question is both about downsides and why we haven't seen this adopted mm -hmm. more broadly. Yes. You know, I think uh, certainly with any policy that would expand solar energy, there are opponents uh, for reasons that range from, you know, incumbent energy interests to perceived and real challenges with integrating solar onto the grid. But when we're talking about this policy in particular, I think you have to look at sort of the timeline at which solar costs have come down and the, the states that you see on the map having just recently pioneered these policies. Mm -hmm. So both of those, have hap those trends have happened in the past five to, to maybe seven years for the very first community solar program. And so I think that it's still sort of early days uh, and now's the time to expand faster. All right, good energy behind that. Uh, Vidisha, we're gonna come back to you. What about graduates who are offered a job at a startup in one of your target cities? Would you consider including them in your visa category? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, as I was thinking about the visa category, the intent was, if you remember the qualifying criteria, there was one element around the idea. Um, so yes, we need tech entrepreneurship and tech investments across all of these uh, locations. But if we can bolster that with innovative ideas that are more focused on say sustainability or climate control, it's great. So in case if the startup opportunity that people are talking about uh, allows that opportunity for, for the tech students, maybe we can consider, but my proposal was more focused on new opportunities and entrepreneurs versus workers because that creates another level of differentiation of I can, why will I get benefit if I'm just working for a startup versus an established company in these smaller company, uh, smaller locations. So the focus is on entrepreneurship and the focus is on creating these new ideas and enabling a lot more technology investments versus just increasing skilled labor. Great. Julianne. You have the microphone, so this will be a quick transition for you. Uh, what's the advantage of running this program out of the state rather than doing so at a company by company level? Well, I think it depends how ambitious we are. Uh, if we want something which is scalable, um, we have to start at the state level and then bring it to the entire country. Um, and I believe that companies that, that we're targeting they need this support, they can't do it by themselves. We can't just uh, have a, or say a ad hoc program based on the companies. Um, I think the, having the federal or even state program bring a framework uh, for the companies to succeed in this uh, uh, mission. Okay. Joyce, I'm gonna ask you to grab the microphone from Julian. I already don't carry cash. This is the premise of the question. So how will your proposal affect me? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Um, a lot of us don't carry cash, but a lot of us also have bank accounts. That's not the case for everyone. And especially when we're looking at on an international scale, uh, many people internationally don't have access to ATMs. It's very difficult for a bank to set up a brick and mortar in their area. Um, and even if you don't carry cash here in the United States, you might still carry cash when you travel. So there's a lot of different use cases um, that apply outside of our borders that can still be beneficial to US citizens, while also being really beneficial to the international uh, market. 
especially for people who are very dependent um, on small goods and meaning that they really care that your $1 bill is really a $1 bill. And counterfeitism is extremely dangerous to those kinds of economies. By having a digital dollar that's secured um, and backed by the United States, that helps eliminate that risk for them and really helps other um, economies prosper and have a new relationship with the United States that helps build trust. Um, so it's it's there's a lot of different ways that it can affect you, even if we're not using cash in our pockets today in this room. Um, it's something that will affect the way that you interact with uh, markets internationally um, moving forward. Great. I'm going to again remind the folks in the room with a very gentle stare. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please jump to the mic. Dan, I'm going to throw a question to you. Um, you've noted that this is a program that can benefit individuals, not just who are in the companies who run SMEs, but also those of us who are consumers or potential suppliers. I'm curious as to how you think it might function, be it um, in what level of government, or if similar to Julianne, would this be something that might be better addressed at a state level versus a federal level? Uh, that's a great question. There, the sort of my default position is that this would naturally be housed under the Department of Commerce's sort of authority. They already have a foreign trade, uh, a foreign trade organization and expertise in foreign trade to begin with that we could build upon there. I think as a practical matter, it would probably start with a pilot program where the Department of Commerce would would oversee it and perhaps contract with consulting firms that are already out there. Um, to, to, to get off the ground, and then we can determine over time whether it becomes sort of an internal think tank at the Department of Commerce or if sort of a public-private partnership makes the most sense. I had not considered housing it at, for example, the state level. I think if we're talking about national risks, which I think is what we're primarily concerned here with, because I don't think the supply chain risks usually come from um, uh, the geopolitical risks I'm describing come from, you know, if you're an Illinois small business buying your product from Wisconsin. Uh, so I think it probably makes sense to keep the focus at the national level because it's really more of a national risk, but I certainly uh, would want to give more thought to whether or not it could be done on a state-by-state -state basis. Wonderful. Thank you. Milena, yes. how have these policies played out so far in the states that have already adopted? You noted in your previous response, this is sort of early days, but curious if you've seen any um, better adoption rates among some of the communities that you talked about in terms of who this policy might target and provide access for community solar power? Sure. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that we've seen is that uh, it really is important to think proactively about including low-income households and, and proactively encouraging the companies to serve low-income households. Uh, this is a tool that can fantastically increase access for those households and those communities that otherwise typically haven't accessed. Um, but it can be, there are also plenty of folks who aren't low income that stand to benefit. And, and I think proactively thinking about those communities is really important. Um, it's a feature of the Illinois program. And uh, I think we've seen it in other states be a success as well. Great. Hassan, why hasn't Canada done this? Just to make it real short and sweet and noting this is your personal opinion and not that of your organization. That's that's right. Um, so in 2007, the United States offered Canada a 0% rate like it, like it does with all of its other major allies, and they declined the offer. Um, and it's... It's a bit peculiar to me. I mean, I think that if you ask some folks, I think they'll say, well, you know, we're negotiating based off of this OECD model treaty. It provides for that withholding. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the world is moving in a different direction, um, at, at least within, um, you know, this sphere. So, I mean, I think if you look at the EU, um, because they're trying to integrate their economies, they've kind of let that go. Um, and I would love to see U.S. and Canada and, and even Mexico kind of kind of have their own little sphere where we can have a free flow of capital. Um, and, um, you know, I, I would hope that the next time the, the United States offers that 0% rate, that Canada would, would accept it. Okay. Well, hopefully someone's listening out there. Um, I'm going to open it one last moment. I see no, no movement.
So I want to thank everyone again for joining us here this evening. A lot of work has gone into not just the presentations that are here, but also those that were done by other members of the cohort who also stood on the stage masked in February and March to present their proposals. There's a lot of things that younger leaders can bring to the policy table, and I think you've seen a snapshot of that here this evening. So again, thank you so much for joining us here in the room. Thank, uh, thank you to those of you who have logged in online. Um, if you'd like to rewatch, this video will be archived. I'm sure some of you will be sending it along to family and friends to uh, spark a lovely Sunday evening dinner. And again, I want to thank the presenters here today remotely in the room. And I also want to congratulate the Emerging Leaders Class of 2022 for an exceptional year. Thank you again. Thank you.